Okay, let's get started. Um, today we're happy to have uh, Shamit from Stanford to tell us about T3 metrics. Take it away. Thanks. Um, so please feel free to interrupt with questions. I don't know the, the custom here. Uh, I'm gonna go slowly and I'll have, you know, it'll be a very schematic talk. There are complicated formulas at my age. It, it's hard enough for me to remember simple formulas. Um, but my subject is K3 metrics and, and a way that we think you can get nice formulas for them from string theory. Um, I'll say a lot of things that are review or general knowledge just because different people from different eras know different things. But to the extent I say anything new, it's based on work appearing in two papers that were jointly authored with Arnab Tripathi and Max Stemet. Uh, Arnab is currently an assistant professor at Harvard, Max is a postdoc there. They were both here as students a few years ago. Um, and I have to say our second paper that, that's here appeared in June of last year. And since then, Max and Arnoff have really undertaken a, a program to turn this into rigorous and proper mathematics and extend it. And um, I have instead done my duties as department chair during COVID. So I'll end you off in, in June of, of 2020. And I suspect the story will evolve a great deal from there and younger and more able uh, hands than mine will carry it forward. Okay, so, so what are we talking about? There is a, uh, a well-known conjecture due to Calabi that there is a unique Ritchie flat Kaler metric on a Kaler manifold under a relatively mild topological restriction vanishing for a string class for each choice of the cohomology class of the Kaler form. So this conjecture was made, I think in the fifties and it was proved by Yao actually when he was at Stanford in the late seventies. Um, and the result has been amazingly useful both in mathematics and physics, but it's also famously a non-constructive proof. So in particular, for the case of compact Calabiaus as opposed to special non-compact geometries, um, constructing these metrics in any reasonable, um, how to say, aesthetic way has, has been challenging. Of course, there are numerical methods and those can be arbitrarily intricate and powerful. Now, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not an algebraic or differential geometer. Um, so I'll represent myself by this little schematic picture of the M theory, uh, I guess it, it, it's a, a hexagon sort of thing here with different limits that correspond to weakly coupled limits of, of string theory. Um, and why is a string theorist interested in, in Calabi or Yeah, Well, we're interested because these spaces solve the vacuum Einstein equations because they have Ritchie flat metrics. And so in some leading approximation to string theory, um, in absence of sources, you get the vacuum Einstein equations. And so maybe these spaces are relevant. Complicated as they are, they are sort of the spherical cows uh, of string theory because they, they preserve some supersymmetry. And so however complicated they are, they're easier than anything relevant to our world. Now, more generally, um, they also play a really interesting role in considerations of duality, of differential geometry, and of algebraic geometry. Um, and frankly, my motivation comes more from, from these questions than from the questions directly relevant to string compactification. So today what I'm gonna try and describe are some conceptually new approaches to the problem of understanding these metrics um, in what I consider to be a Goldilocks example of such a space, right? Goldilocks has the, the three bowls of porridge and there's one that's too, too hot, one that's too cold and one that's just right. Um, tori are too, you know, they're too easy. They're like the, 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 the um, you know, the, the tiny uh, unfavorable bowl of porridge on one side and um, generic Calabia three folds or N folds are a little too hard, but somewhere in the middle there is K3, which, which is a compact hyper Kaler manifold of dimension four. And because it's hyper Kaler, it and its higher dimensional hyper Kaler cousins share some simplifications despite the fact that they're compact. And in the case of K3, it has the generic holonomy for its dimension, it's SU2. Um, so hyper Kaler is the same as Calabia on that dimension. So I'm gonna attack the problem of finding its Ritchie flat metric in a way that should be broadly familiar to aficionados of 3D mirror symmetry. Okay, the idea is there will be some new ideas, but the basic slogans, you know, from a 30,000 foot point of view should be, should be familiar. Um, I'll construct some auxiliary theory that has a Coulomb branch. That Coulomb branch will arise and, you know, it'll be a little string on T3 and I'll describe that construction for those who grew up in the wrong era to know what that means. Um, there will be an expression for the metric that comes out of that construction, the metric on K3. Um, that roughly, and this is pretty heuristic, um, that for the relevant objects that determine the, metri the metric, looks like there's a classical contribution, a loop contribution, and some instanton contributions. And those instanton contributions have a beautiful geometric interpretation known to geometers as 
disk instant ensembles in the sort of algebraic geometry of K3, they, they correspond to certain kinds of holomorphic disks with boundaries on certain manifolds. Um, and the, the guiding formalism on this Coulomb branch picture is that developed by Gaia Omora Nitsky around 2009. Now, that will be a, a story that in itself gives an expression for the metric that's complicated and perhaps tractable, but um, it would be a hard nut to crack on its own. Um, but what we realized um, by the time we wrote the paper last May is that there's a second way to approach the same problem, where the theory that we're interested in arises with K3 is its Higgs branch. Um, the theory is roughly a D2 brain probe, and you'll, you'll see where that comes in. The data determining the metric is purely classical. Uh, and in fact, the, the same metric that must come out of this GMN formalism with all the disk instantons arises as a, a rather complicated hyper work quotient. Um, and in, in some sense, this is a realization of an old idea that maybe you could realize K3 is an infinite dimensional hyper work quotient. So both sides are interesting, and it's really the interplay of the two sides that's interesting to me because, you know, to be totally honest, I don't care what the metric looks like. What I care about is the rich interplay of ideas that underlies it. And so I'll spend a great deal of time sort of develop, developing the quantum geometry of the Coulomb branch. Um, but really, the true solution emerges from the dual perspective. And if you were somebody who really just cared about the metric, you could ignore the first 45 minutes of my talk, um, look at the last 10 minutes and say, here's a practical algorithm for making a metric, and I'll just do that. OK, so to begin with, let me introduce, the I think, the star of our story, physically speaking. Which is the little string theory. Um, so one of the, you know, there were many great, great um, products of the duality revolution in the mid 90s. Obviously, the most famous is, is ADS CFT. Um, but a little bit before that, there was a discovery of a host of simple new theories that come out of string theory as predictions, but that don't have gravity. Okay. And the thing that was so interesting about them is that there was a really precise sense in, in which they were not expected to exist. For instance, um, conformal fixed points above four dimensions were objects of suspicion because they couldn't be constructed in simply, you know, in simple weakly coupled manners. Simple, you know, examples with scalars or yang mills fields don't work so well. Um, but it was really very decisively seen using the, the tools of duality that, that such fixed points exist in five and six dimensions when they're supersymmetry. And you know, their fate without supersymmetry, especially above dimension six, remains a little bit mysterious. So the main tools of discovery. Um, were the P brains of string theory, D brains or NS brains, um, and the low energy theories on those when you embed them in various backgrounds of the 10 dimensional theory. There was another tool um, that maybe is closer in spirit to our talk, which is instead of studying, uh, oops, the theory on uh, some stack of D brains, maybe in a complicated geometry, um, you can instead, instead take a, a Claudia manifold and make a a suitable degeneration that makes the space locally singular, so the metric degenerates. It, when you do this, if you do it the right way, you take the right scaling limit, the local physics of modes concentrated at the singularity uh, is often one of the same kinds of theories that arise on these brains and can give rise to, for instance, a higher dimensional conformal fixed point or other exotic physics. Now, the, the poster child, the simplest example of a Calabiao singularity that produces something interesting is just the AD or ED generation of a K3 surface, right? So um, these are singularities characterized by various collapsing two cycles with, with intersection matrices that, that give you uh, A and D N or EN type. And um, they were studied in great detail by mathematicians in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, like Kronheimer, um, locally as ALE spaces. But when they rise on a K3 surface, they give um, in type 2A string theory an AD or E gauge theory, and in type 2B string theory, they give a novel theory um, that's thought to be a conformal fixed point in six dimensions, which has a dual description um, in 2A in terms of coincident NS5 brains. There's a sort of T-duality between the AN singularity, say, uh, and N plus one NS5 brains in type 2A string theory. So these theories have two comma zero supersymmetry, they're six dimensional, and they are maybe the first simplest examples of the kinds of exotic new theories that I was mentioning. So this is what I was just saying. If you carefully study the physics of the singular K3 or on these brains, you find, for instance, this two zero supersymmetric theory. And it's probably its most famous uses in explaining S-duality. If you compactify this thing on a two torus, it has 16 supercharges. So it has little choice but to flow in the infrared 
can either be free or can flow to an interacting n equals four super yang mills as far as we know it, it chooses the latter so generally it flows to super yang mills and the um, obvious duality symmetries of, of the t2 just the familiar sl2z um, gives rise to an sl2z s duality of the uh, low energy theory there and so this is a quick and dirty explanation of s duality now slightly less famous than that theory but more useful for my purposes today um, there's another theory that's still smaller than the full string theory. It's a decoupling limit. Um, so it's a low energy limit of the full string theory, um, but it's bigger than the two comma zero field theory, and it still exists in its own right. And it's the so-called little string theory that lives on the NS5 brains and includes more modes than the field theory. In particular, um, it comes with a finite scale and string of its, you know, of its little strings. Uh, and those little strings give it, for instance, familiar features of string theory, like a, a Hagedorn density of states. Okay, and this thing has holographic duals and you, know, you can study it using various techniques in, in string theory. And so we understand a little bit about it. So now again, I'm, I'm gonna review what I was saying and, and add some details. The simplest two zero NS5 brain theory, the little string say, has many interesting properties. If you compactify it on a two torus, so there's just one such brain, it gives rise to a theory that looks at low energy like a U1 gauge theory that comes from, in some heuristic sense, the tensor multiplied in six dimensions. Um, and if you ask, what is the moduli space of this? Well, the analogs of Wilson lines of the modes present in six dimensions um, give you a, a Coulomb branch of that U1 gauge theory that is, after you work it out and go through all the right dualities, the dual of the mirror torus. Okay, but roughly this is the statement that Wilson lines live on a dual torus. Yeah, that's a theory in four dimensions, right? We compactified the, the two zero theory on a, on a two torus. We could also compactify on a three torus or one of the special form T2 times S1. So if we did that, we'd get two additional scalars. This will come up again and again in the talk. Um, we get an abelian gauge field um, present in the Coulomb branch of the two zero theory giving rise to a Wilson line, which is gonna be periodic. And, and that gives us one scalar in the three-dimensional theory. Now, there's also a three-dimensional photon, but in three dimensions, photons have one polarization degree of freedom. So that's like one scalar. And in fact, you can dualize the abelian field strength F mu nu to a scalar phi um, via this transformation shown here. And so you get two scalars coming from the Wilson line of the four-dimensional abelian gauge field and the dual photon. Now, the moduli space in four dimensions for this theory was a, a torus of some sort. These two additional modes, it turns out, um, give you another two torus. So the, the, the total geometry is that of a four torus. Um, that's most evident in M theory, and I'll give you an M theory picture a little later. Um, but um, this is dual to just a, a membrane probing a four torus. Now, why am I reviewing that? I understand that you're all sophisticated people, um, but I like to be self-contained and I'm reviewing that because we're gonna use an analogous but more complicated system where all the same ideas appear, um, but we're now the little string theory has a moduli space that's given by a K3 surface. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And then understanding the physics of that little string at low energy will be um, our trick for trying to get a description of the metric. So the theory we were just talking about had 16 supercharges or the equivalent in four dimensions of N equals four supersymmetry. And the one that we're gonna be interested in is a cousin, um, which was the first one historically discovered. I'm old enough that I was around, so I remember. Um, that has four dimensional n equals two supersymmetry instead. What are the properties of this theory? Well, first, how do you get it? How is it discovered? Um, it turns out that instead of just considering Neville Schwartz five brains in type 2a and type 2b string theory, where after all, you might be tempted to consider d brains instead since they're so much easier to play with, um, you could think about the heterotic string. Now, there, there's no temptation from d brains because we don't really know what the analog of d brains is. Um, but we do have NS5 brains. And so you could ask, what is the low energy theory on NS5 brains in the heterotic string? Uh, you can ask this in both the E8 times E8 and SO32 theory. Once you put the theories on a circle, they become the same. So I'll answer this in the SO32 theory. And either by studying it directly or considering a, a dual picture in type one, you conclude that it's a theory that it's again a little string, which at low energies um, reduces to an SU2 gauge theory with a certain number of hypermultiples. So the SO32 global symmetry is something that you can see immediately in a type one description coming from, you know, five, nine strings. 
Now, this theory we're going to again compactify. If you compactify this on a torus, it's at low energies uh, of n equals two field theory of, you know, the SU2 means it's rank one in some natural sense. But now the Coulomb branch is instead of a torus in the previous simpler case, it's a sphere. And maybe the easiest way to think about this theory is in a dual frame um, of D3 brains moving on the base of an elliptic K3 in F theory, right? So um, we're free to think of the, the heterotic string on T2 in a dual description as, um, as F theory on elliptic K3. And the wrapped phi brain becomes a D3 moving around on the P1 base of the elliptic K3 that's visible on F theory. Okay, now the generic elliptic K3, if, if you're at a smooth point in moduli space, doesn't have any ADE singularities, but it does have 24 points where the elliptic fiber degenerates with a simple node, like shown you know, in this picture here. Okay, so the total space of this elliptic vibration, including the singular fibers over the P1 is a K3, only the P1 base is visible to, to the three brain probe. And so what it sees is a P1 Coulomb branch with 24 marked points. Locally, the physics of each marked point in 2B string theory is that there's a seven brain stretching down um, from the marked point and filling the rest of space. You can't put all of those seven brains into the same, you know, one zero D seven duality frame simultaneously, but locally near any seven brain, you can always choose such a frame. And so locally near any seven brain, there's a duality frame where you get just the light three seven string as the relevant degree of freedom as the brain probe approaches that singular point. And so what you should think of is that this theory has a P1 with 24 electron points, but the electrons aren't all electric with respect to the same gauge field. You have to do duality transformations um, to get you know, from the relevant gauge field for one to the relevant gauge field for the other. Now, when you compactify that theory on an additional circle, right, F theory on a circle becomes M theory and the entire elliptic K3 becomes visible. So you now get a three-dimensional theory whose moduli space is a K3 surface. And this was explained most, um, you know, most simply by Intrilligator in a paper, um, I think in the late 90s or early, maybe 2000. Okay, so, so our three brain moving around on this P1 now becomes a two plus one dimensional theory that really sees the fibers and the total space of this thing is a K3. And that is the moduli space of, of the resulting two plus one dimensional theory, still a Coulomb branch. And as a reprise of what we said before in the, in the, the free case of the single two zero five brain, you know, where do you get the elliptic fibers physically in going from four to three dimensions? Well, the Wilson line of the gauge field um, gives one scalar, the dual photon gives another, and together they sort of sweep out this elliptic fiber over each point on the base here. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about motivating this picture of the Coulomb branch. If there are questions now, um, this is a great time to ask. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to what is probably the least satisfying section of the talk, where I discuss the really complicated formalism underlying hyperkähler metrics on these Coulomb branches. Um, and then at the end, I'll move to a much simpler formalism. But the data that, that parameterizes the Coulomb branch answer is really interesting. And the simpler formalism, I think the main interest in it for me is that it answers this question. Okay, so let's leave that story for a minute. We're going to keep it in our minds. There's some two plus one dimensional theory with K3 as its moduli space. And now just discuss some generalities about four dimensional n equals two theories, which we're going to put on a circle. So the multiplets, famously, there's sort of two massless, you know, potentially massless multiplets. There's a vector multiplet, which has a gauge field a mu, a gauge eno lambda. And then because of the extended supersymmetry, it also has what would be a chiral multiplet of n equals one buried in it in the adjoint representation of G because it's related by supersymmetry to the gauge field. So there's a complex scalar phi and it's Fermion partner. And then the matter multiplet is a hypermultiplet, which is just um, roughly two chiral multiplets and conjugate representations R of the, and R bar of the gauge group. So there would be sort of a chiral Q and psi Q and, and a conjugate Q tilde and psi Q tilde, and they're all buried together in one multiplet of n equals two. Now, with, that, with this much supersymmetry, in 40n equals one, we could have a super potential and a priori finding it as a complicated calculation, or if you're a low energy theorist, you're free to postulate it. With n equals two, the super potential is basically determined by supersymmetry, right? So the moduli space of vacua is, is just determined once I tell you the field content, though it may be difficult to write down explicitly. And the typical picture is there are Coulomb branches. Um, these are branches where 
you know, phi gets a VEV and, and maybe typically the Qs and Qtilas are massive. Uh, there are Higgs branches, which are not surprisingly places where Q and Q tilde get, get, get a VEV and typically the gauge field is, is massive. Uh, and that there can be mixed branches, they won't be relevant for us, um, where you know some of the gauge group is broken to abelian factors, other pieces aren't, and, and parametrizing the content is more complicated. Okay. Now, the geometry of these branches is quite elegant. When you're on a Coulomb branch, it turns out that the, the Coulomb branch parametrizes a, what's called a special k -wire manifold, or rigid special k -wire, for those of you who know about the special k -wire relevant to Coulomb Yeah. Um, well, the Higgs branch parametrizes a hyper k -wire manifold. Um, here, the natural geometry is a generalization of complex, right? Because the natural scalar in the gauge multiple is a complex scalar, whereas here the, the Qs and Q tildes come in uh, in four plets, and the natural geometry is is hyperscale. Now, on compactification to three D, um, the Coulomb branch gets these additional scalars that come from the gauge field uh, Wilson line and the dual of the of the abelian gauge fields themselves, and it turns out that the Coulomb branch becomes hyperscalar too. Because the Higgs branch doesn't change at all and was already hyper k -wire, that's sort of necessary for mirror symmetry, and that's why mirror symmetry is a thing in three dimensions. So for instance, for a one-dimensional complex 4D Coulomb branch, um, the picture you should have is as you go down on the circle, you fiber the, the dual photon and, and the Wilson line over it, and, and you end up with something of a higher dimension, which for brain probes, in our case, um, turns out to be the complete space of an elliptic Calabi yeah. Okay, and, and so in this kind of picture, you should imagine the three brain probe is the relevant theory, fibers degenerating into D7s due to light electrons, and the light electrons arising from the three seven strings. So that's how this fits into a general discussion of, of four dimensional gauge theories. Um, how, does you, how does this help you find the metric on the 4D and 3D Coulomb range? So again, let me go through a famous story, starting in four dimensions and then going to three where it's, it's more complicated and maybe less familiar. Um, let's call the Coulomb branch modulus A. Um, we're gonna be focusing on a case where, where the base of this vibration is one dimensional, like our P1 base in F theory. So there's sort of naturally one complex scalar parametrizing this base. Um, so we'll call it A. So for each point on this A plane, it turns out that you have an auxiliary structure, um, a cyborg Witten curve. And this is a familiar story for 4D n equals 2 gauge theories. There's a, a Riemann surface associated to a Coulomb branch, and the periods of an associated differential on the, on the, the Riemann surface give you the low energy data. Okay, and in our particular case of interest, the cyborg witten curve is of genus 1, and the periods of the, the cyborg witten differential on this curve then determine the geometry of the modulus space. Okay, so it's a genus 1 thing. So above each point in the A plane, there's, this is terrible notation, I apologize. I somehow always end up doing this. There's an A cycle and a B cycle. This A is not the same as the modulus. And so in a really wonderful notation, the integral of the preferred differential over the A cycle is the value of the A modulus. So these A's are different. And the integral of the preferred differential over the B cycle is then the derivative of a holomorphic function with respect to A. Uh, this holomorphic function is the central object of the Coulomb branch of n equals two theories in four dimensions. This is the so-called prepotential. And the prepotential is the god of these theories. Um, for instance, the gauge coupling function tau, so the imaginary part is one over g squared, and the real part is theta angle of the gauge theory, is given by, by derivatives of f. And the Kähler metric on moduli space is also given in terms of derivatives of f. So if you can find this one holomorphic object f, or equivalently, if you know the family of cyborg witten curves and the preferred differential, um, you know about as much about the low energy theory as you could hope to. Um, maybe a less dramatic way of saying it, but one that's actually accurate to the history of physics is, this is how you find the pion Lagrangian. And it just so happens that there's this really complicated formalism for giving the pion Lagrangian with all the proper f pi's for n equals two theories. Now, all of the states in these theories satisfy BPS bound um, due to supersymmetry. Because there's extended supersymmetry, you can find sometimes charged states in short representations of the symmetry. And then because they're in short representations, um, when they saturate the, the bound given by this BPS bound, uh, you know, they can't really decay very easily. Um, they only decay at walls of marginal stability. And so this BPS bound is that the mass of a particle has to be greater than or equal to a central charge determined by A and DFDA, determined by the prepotential. 
And that's the value of that central charge depends where you are on the Coulomb branch and what the electric and magnetic charges are of the object that you're studying. Okay, so again, the states that saturate the bound are in short multiplets and they will be stable. That's the 4D story. And the hero of our story is, is this, this prepotential F and then the associated spectrum of BPS states. And finding them is a complicated dynamical question. So now there's a 3D story. Um, our 4D theory has some action. In a conventional notation for electromagnetism, there'd be a gauge coupling E, there'd be a theta angle theta. Uh, and in, at a given point in moduli space, there'd be an auxiliary torus with tau equal to theta plus E I over E squared with some pi's that are probably right in some conventions. If you're reduced to 3D from 4D, this torus becomes physical. So the action from the new scalar fields that span this torus um, is given by, you know, the radius of the circle um, and some factors of pi in terms of um, the, the dual photon and the Wilson line that comes out of dimensional reduction. And the reason that one over Rs appear here instead of Rs when you're reducing on a circle where you'd expect Rs to appear is because when you switch to the dual fields, um, the powers of R get a little bit uh, intricate. But after you do all the rescalings properly, including the duality, this is where the Rs end up. Okay. Now, what this gives is an elliptic vibration over the old Coulomb branch as the moduli space in three dimensions, the new Coulomb branch. And if you ask what is the area of the elliptic fiber, um, well, it's given by one over R. Now, again, the units here might be confusing. Let's think about it. A scalar field in two plus one dimensions has dimension a half. So the area of an elliptic curve should be dimension one. And out of a circle of radius r, the way you're going to get dimension one is this way. Uh, if you want to use more conventional units, you can rescale to any units you like by using the fact that the gauge coupling in three dimensions is dimensional. OK, so the leading large r metric is then given by combining the kinetic terms for the new scalars with those that you derived using the prepotential on the 40 Coulomb branch. Okay, and then there's sort of three sources of physical correction to a naive, naive classical picture where you just took the 40 gauge theory, you went to the Coulomb branch by assigning a VEV to phi, the scalar and the gauge multiplet, uh, and then you just put it on a circle, right? So that's a nice classical picture. Uh, and so of course it misses essentially all the interesting physics. Um, so what are the sources of physical corrections? Well, first of all, there are one loop corrections in the 40 theory, right? In a brain picture, they look like this. There are corrections due to 40 instantons. These are precisely what Cyborg and Witten um, augmented their fame by computing, right? By very indirect considerations, really not by any direct calculus, but by inferring what F must be due to a variety of indirect considerations. Um, and then finally, there are new instanton corrections when you go from four to three dimensions that come from BPS particles of the 4D theory that run around the circle that you, that you added in going from four to three. And so you get, give you new BPS contributions that could a priori correct the metric. Now, this leads us into a really beautiful and intricate subject on which there are um, literally hundreds of pages of papers just by the original authors, Guy Odomor and Nitsky, who developed a story for how you compute the hyperkähler metric on a Coulomb branch um, given certain observables of the theory, which I call indices because in one natural way of thinking about them, there's a minus one of the F insertion. Um, but the way you define these things is as follows. You imagine a state of charge gamma. Uh, it can be an external state. There doesn't have to be a dynamical state in the theory or just in a charge gamma. It's a, it's, a, it's a massive inserted probe of charge gamma. Okay. Um, you, you, you allow it to move on the circle. You compute a Wilson line in the presence of this probe. The, the supersymmetric Wilson line, including both um, trace of e to the a, but also the scalar partner of a. Okay, so you compute the supersymmetric Wilson line in the presence of the charge gamma as a function of where you are on the Coulomb branch, which I've now called u, that's uh, an invariant analog of a, uh, a theta angle. Uh, and um, in general, um, this, this theta is, if, if you want, the um, Wilson line. And, and then a choice of, of a parameter um, I think that's called zeta, that Greek symbol, um, which I'll define more in a second, okay? So, so the observable you compute is the trace of minus one of the F in the presence of this external charge gamma, e to the minus a suitable Hamiltonian that I'll tell you in a second, and an insertion of the Wilson line of the gate shield on the circle. 
So for each choice of gamma and maybe various global charges, you can define such an observable at each point in the moduli space. And for each choice of this parameter zeta that I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, what is zeta? Um, we're in a hyper Kalar manifold, which is rather unpleasant um, because it means that for those of us used to thinking about complex geometry, there's a huge ambiguity for each choice of point um, in this hyper Kalar manifold. There's a full S2 of choices of complex structures. And this parameter zeta is supposed to parameterize that choice. Okay, so there's a sphere of possible choices of complex structure. And the, um, the, the relevant central charge that appears in this Hamiltonian uh, measuring masses of states will depend on the choice of zeta in a certain way. Okay. So, so now I'm going to just do some classical hyper Kalar geometry. Um, the details aren't too important. What's important is the punchline that comes out. Okay. So famously, in a hyper Kalar manifold, there's not just a Kalar form, um, right? There, there's generally a whole sphere of choices of the preferred two form. Um, and so we can define omega bar of zeta to be this linear combination um, of, of the sort of preferred um, symplectic forms on this hyper Kalar manifold. And it, it varies with the choice of zeta as you'd expect. And the definition as I've written, it uses the sort of three choices of Kalar form you could make by changing um, you know, your choice of which of these two forms is the Kalar form at different points on the sphere, the north front and right poles in some way of talking. Now, it follows from results in hyper Kalar geometry um, that you can express the metric in terms of these omegas. Okay, so, so this is just a powerful result I'm taking from classical geometry of many decades ago. And it's a result of GMN, of these many hundreds of papers of GMN, sorry, many hundreds of pages of results of GMN, that omega bar, which encodes this triplet of two forms, has an expression in terms of the observables X gamma that I defined before. Okay, so remember, this is a lot to, to absorb. For each choice of an external charge uh, with gamma the gauge charge, you can define an observable X, which is a supersymmetric Wilson line in the presence of an external charge gamma. It's given by this kind of a trace. And if you can compute those X's and take their log, you can write a closed form expression for um, the triplet of two forms in terms of the log of those x's. The d prime here is a derivative on the moduli space with um, zeta fixed. Okay, I think that that's basically what I wanted to say about the x gamma. Okay, so the upshot is if we can compute these sort of um, piecewise well-behaved holomorphic observables x gamma for a basis of the charge lattice, we can then use this formula of GMN to compute omega, we can then use this formula to compute the metric, uh, and we can declare a victory. Okay, so let's and and you know okay so why didn't why wasn't this done years ago? Well, there are a few subtleties. One is um, the formalism was developed in field theory, and you sort of need to prove that the results for these x gammas converge in the right sense, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's that's stuff that you can generalize to the little string, and we talked about that in one of the papers um, that I cited at the start. Okay, so let's see how this fits together in some formulae. This will continue to be unpleasant. So, you know, if, if you're at home and you have a child or something, this is a good time to feed the child. And then in 10 minutes, I'll say things that are much simpler that should give the equivalent physics. Okay, so um, we should expect at least that in the large radius loan of the circle, we're going from four dimensions to three dimensions. Um, you know, we, we have a circle. When it's large, maybe life should be simpler. There should be some kind of semi-classical physics from the three-dimensional point of view. So, okay, recall we're trying to compute, if we really wanted to compute the X gamma from which we could extract the, the triplet of two forms and the metric, we would want to compute, you know, a line operator index and a charge sector gamma, which involves evaluating this trace. And um, in the large radius limit, writing down what this is, a, you know, the trace of becomes really simple. Um, the relevant Hamiltonian is just a zeta dependent sum of central charges, Z gamma and Z bar gamma, where Z is the same as the Z of Cyber and Witten theory um, evaluated in charge sector gamma. So for the problem at hand of the three brain probe, um, probing the elliptic K3, 
the 4D formulae for the Coulomb branch geometry actually gives a result that, that's known from the early 1990s, which mathematicians call the semi-flat metric. Um, and physicists have sometimes, um, starting with this paper, called the stringy cosmic string. Um, so this is the, 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 the P1 with 24 light electron points. You find an expression for the metric that looks like this. E to the phi is a completely known function. It has 24 interesting points, which are precisely the electron points where there's a degeneration. You can think of that encoding the fact that uh, the gauge coupling vanishes an electron point and the metric has suitable related behavior by supersymmetry. Um, there's, you know, so there's dependence on the complex structure of the elliptic fiber above each point and so on and so forth in the expected way. Okay, but heuristically, the U's in the expression for this degenerate large complex structure K3 metric are coordinates on the 40 Coulomb branch, and the Z's are coordinates on the 40 elliptic fibers. Um, and, and you have a rather explicit expression for the metric, but which is also an old expression. Okay, so we certainly had nothing to add to this old expression except to say, here's what you should get in some way. So now you'd like to include the instantons. Um, and that would give a more complete answer that would sort of puff up the metric away from, um, away from the, the, the large complex stru structure or semi-flat limit. And in this duality frame, you can state what the answer would be somewhat implicitly in terms of certain BPS numbers. Um, and that's still progress. One could in principle solve that problem directly because these are morally more topological in nature than, than a metric is. So let's discuss that a little bit and then talk about how we're going to solve for those numbers. So heuristically, you expect these X gammas, the traces I described, to be given by their values in the semi-flat limit, which we know, times one plus order e to the minus r. As you move away from the semi-flat limit, um, r is moving away from infinity, and the instanton contributions from the new states, the BPS states of the 43 running around the circle, are becoming finite. Now, formally, these x's actually satisfy a very nice equation, which was the output of GMN, a Riemann-Hilbert problem. Um, and, and you can show that they solve an integral equation that relates their value at the semi-flat limit to their exact value in terms of a closed form set of integrals that, however, require um, some rather interesting data. They require the exact knowledge of the, the dynamical BPS count of the theory you're interested in in, in every charge sector. Okay, so if you know the 4D BPS spectrum and you know the semi-flat or, or semi-classical limit of the Xs, you have a closed integral equation you can iterate to get an expansion for the exact Xs from which you can read off the metric. Which means you need to figure out all these BPS state counts. Okay, and so again, um, your eyes have probably glazed over unless, well, maybe you're all very mathematical people. But anyway, um, you need to determine these numbers. It's still progress because when I hear metric, I think of an ungodly mess with no rigidity in it. Um, when I think of a BPS state count, I think of an integer, which a priori you can determine by doing various clever things involving limit taking. So, you know, this, this might actually be a point of view you could use in its own right to solve the problem. And in fact, something rather similar to the Gross Wilson approximation, which is sort of a famous once improved approximation to the metric. Um, better than the stringy cosmic string will emerge in the, in the dumbest possible way of, of using this, this kind of approximation scheme where you do what, you know, what a physicist would be inclined to do is um, you use sort of the lightest BPS states and say, well, if I know the lightest BPS states at a given point, we should get a pretty good approximation to the metric in that neighborhood, right? So if you do that, you include only instanton corrections um, that come from the strings, the lightest strings stretching to each seven brains sort of the lightest electrons near where you are. Um, you'll basically recover this gross Wilson approximation or at least this data and the details of whether you get exactly that depend on how you, you complete your approximation, okay? But that's not very satisfactory. So we can recover this as the first approximation to what we're doing. Um, but the real question here is how do you determine these exactly, okay? And there are various smart ideas about how you might do that by direct counting. Um, but I at least grew up in an era when the, the, real, um, the real answer to this was you wait around and think until you think of an easier way to do it. And, and so that's what we did. And string duality turns out to answer this question. Okay, it provides a dual frame where the metric computation is completely classical. And turning that around, as in classical mirror symmetry, um, you can determine these integer invariants. Okay. 
Okay, so this is the Higgs branch formalism. So we got as far as we did um, in the particular problem of K3 and using this huge machinery of GMN um, applied to the heterotic NS5 brain compacted by Adonis regions. So now let me go back to, um, to duality. The heterotic string on T3 is the same as M theory on K3. This is one of the dualities from 1995, okay? Uh, and so every object in the heterotic theory must have its, its, um, its image in M theory. And if you ask, what is a wrapped NS5 brain of the heterotic theory? Well, it has two dimensions sticking out in the transverse seven dimensions. What's a brain with two dimensions sticking out in the transverse seven dimensions? It's, it's the M2 brain. So the wrapped NS5 brain is the transverse M2 moving around on K3. Now, M theory um, is a theory that many people seem to love, um, but it's one for which I don't really have a lot of computational tools. So from this viewpoint, I don't know exactly what to do. But we can reduce the M theory side further on a transverse circle, turning the M2 brain into a D2 brain of type 2A string theory. Now, if you do this, you might worry that you're changing the problem that you're studying. But the 2A string coupling, which interpolates between the D2 and M2 pictures from the type 2 point of view, actually doesn't control any corrections to the Higgs branch metric. So here, a non-renormalization theorem of the extended supersymmetry saves you. You see, you are changing the problem. You're changing by adding the circle and reducing. But the additional parameter you introduce doesn't actually control the object you're interested in in the theory. And so the Higgs branch metric of the D2 theory will give us the desired K3 metric. And this is the sense in which there's an analog of 3D, 3D mirror symmetry. There's a Coulomb branch picture here. There's a Higgs branch picture here. You use this trick to get at the Higgs branch picture, but in the end, the classical picture here should determine the quantum picture. Okay, and then as I said, that means it will in particular encode this infinite number of EPS state counts. So um, I told you we now have a D2 theory and I told you that's supposed to be tractable. Um, and you know, as lazy as I am, that does sound pretty tractable. So now I should tell you how you determine the metric from that point of view. Um, and I'll do my best. I'll, I'll, I'll give you all of the ingredients, but I won't really write down any metrics. Um, there are some formulas in our, in our second paper and they're pretty messy. And so if you're a glutton for punishment, go look. Okay, so what's the easiest way to understand what a D2 brain does on a complicated space like K3? It's to first make the space as simple as possible. So the simplest way to make a K3 surface is as a, a Kummer surface, an orbifold of a four torus by a Z2 involution. And there's sort of a picture here of, you know, you get four fixed points of the Z2 on each two torus of the four torus, and so there are 16 fixed points in the overall thing. Um, and so the geometry is locally, you know, pretty flat and boring, except at 16 interesting points. Okay, so what we're going to do to start is consider a D2 brain probing an orbifold K3. Okay, and now your proper response is, you know, big deal. If I wanted to know the metric on an orbifold K3, I'd write down the flat metric and say something weird happens at these points and be done with it. Um, but the point is for D brains on orbifolds, there's a completely explicit formulation, including the orbifold blow up modes. Um, both for the orbifold and the blow up modes, we rely heavily on old work of Douglas and Moore that's um, complicated but beautiful. And, and so we'll get actually expressions that we can include the blow up modes in to get an expansion for the metric that maps to an expansion for the metric in terms of the disk instant. Okay, so let's work up to the relevant theory in little steps. And then I promise you, I will show you none of the hard calculation. Um, we're gonna work up in little steps by starting with the simplest thing. How would you just describe a bunch of D2s transverse to C2, um, which is our starting point for a four manifold that will eventually be K3. So we'll start by studying the 3D n equals eight theory arising on D2's probing flat space. But, but we're gonna prefer four of the dimensions of that, of that flat space, right? The moduli space of this theory is, is actually um, eight N dimensional. So for a single D2, it would be eight dimensional, including the dual photon. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna privilege four of them by, by doing an artificial separation into an analog of a Higgs and Coulomb bridge. Okay, so I'm gonna set the dual photon and its real scalar partner to vanish. And then I'm gonna break the other three complex scalars that remain, um, there's six dimensions remaining, into something I'll call an adjoint of the 3D n equals four vector multiplet by non-covariantly choosing an n equals four, which will be chosen for us by the problem as we go on, um, and the hypermultiplet. Okay, so those three complex fields, I could call phi u and v, and the n equals four supersymmetry determines that the superpotential is the trace of this, you know, commutator of u and v times phi. 
the equation that you get by varying with respect to phi is that you and v commute. Uh, there is a d-flatness condition that looks like this. And if you ask what are the solutions of these equations, um, a, a little bit of linear algebra that's surprisingly unpleasant, but you can do it, shows that the solutions are diagonal u's and v's up to the action of a permutation group, which is the bio group of the gauge subgroup. Okay, so this is not a big surprise. Um, you get a bunch of D2s moving around on, on an R4 or a C2, um, and you can freeze them. So that's what we got by having the N D2s. Um, now, why did I have N? Well, it's because to get C2 mod Z2 with even a single brain, I'll want to start on the covering C2 with two. And so it was useful to start with S. So to get C2 mod Z2, what I do is start with a covering theory with a D2 in its image, the N equals two case of example one. Um, and then I do the orbifold. And this orbifold action um, imposes projections. Um, one easy way to, to say what the projections are is if you think of U and V as these two by two matrices that include eigenvalues for the positions of those D2s, um, you guess that you should be able to permute the two. If you ask what would a permute, permutation look like on, on you know, a U or V matrix, probably most intuitively you'd think you act with sigma X because that, that looks like zero, one, one, zero, and it sort of switches the two locations. Um, it turns out to be convenient to use a slightly different basis. This was discussed in Douglas and Moore, and so to conjugate by sigma z instead of um, sigma x when you impose the z2 projection. But in any case, the result is the projected theory has degrees of freedom that look like this for u and v, um, and a gauge symmetry that after imposing suitable projections looks like there's a parameter alpha in it. Now, this theory still on C2 mod Z2, oops, um, has, you know, now it actually has the 3D n equals four supersymmetry. It has a super potential that looks like phi UV. There's a super potential constraint, which will tell you that on this, on this Higgs branch, U plus and V plus, the components of, of the hypermultiplet of, of some charge should be related to U minus and V minus by a, a constant. The D term constraint for D flatness tells you that lambda should be one. Um, now, u plus and u minus have different charge by two units. So, you know, this lambda has charge two. So, so doing this doesn't really quite fix the gauge freedom. There's a remaining z2 gauge freedom that relates uv to minus u minus v. Um, that's z2 mod z2. Okay, so, so sort of popping out of the natural construction of Douglas and Moore is a picture of this challenge. Um, let's now slowly build up to our, our case of interest. So now we use the technology that was developed by Wadi Taylor, largely um, because he was interested in matrix theory um, to capture dynamics on a compact space. So let's start with T4 and we're gonna describe KD brains on T4. And we're gonna view T4 as an orbifold of our four by space group with a lattice lambda that's a four dimensional lattice. So on the covering space, KD brains on, you know, on, on the original lift to an infinite number on the covering space. Okay, and what are the matter fields? Well, to make a symmetric construction, you need copies of, of every one of the brains, you know, in, in each sort of fundamental domain of the lattice, right? So you tile the, the, the plane, the R4 plane with, with copies of these D brains. And then if, if K is finite, if you want K D brains, then, then you better have the, the gauge indices, uh, I and J running from one to K. Okay, so in each fundamental domain, you'll have K of the little brains running. Now, there's too many indices here, and this subject is unpleasant enough as it is, so I'll leave the UK gauge indices implicit, and I'll label the fields as, for instance, UNN. So you should think of the UMNs as just the, the string stretching between brains in the mth and nth region of the fundamental domain of the lattice. Then you have to do this sort of huge orbifolding procedure on this infinite dimensional thing, um, what does it say? It says that, well, shifting where you are in, in, you know, in terms of fundamental domains of the lattice, the same in both indices, just translates a pair of brains to another set of fundamental domains. Um, so in general, it does nothing unless M is equal to N. And if M is equal to N, what it does is tell you that you've actually moved over, um, you know, when you, when, you, when you do that translation um, by that amount of fundamental domain. 
Okay, so this, this sort of gives you the invariant degrees of freedom under the orbifold. And what this tells you is up to translations by lattice vectors, only U0n and V0n are independent. Uh, Umn is equal to Un minus m if m is not equal to n. And Unn is given by the guy in the, the, the basic fundamental domain up to translation by, by the vector that gets you to the nth copy of the fundamental domain. Okay, so if this is already a little bit annoying because of the number of indices, just keep in mind that this is just the technology developed to describe, for instance, zero brains on T4 in matrix theory. So it, it's purely kinematic. There is no dynamics here. And so it, it's some algebra you can go through. Now, unsurprisingly, um, when M is not equal to N, right, what, what you have is brains in different fundamental domains on the cover. And so the strings between them are very massive. And if you write down the F and D terms for this gauge theory with a huge number of fields, those massive strings have unsurprisingly mass terms that allows you to integrate them out, okay? So in eventually deriving the low energy dynamics, you integrate out the massive and greater than zero modes. Now for the torus case, you could do this exactly. It's not so interesting because you can guess what the geometry is that you're gonna get. In the analogous construction for K3, which I'm about to describe, the analysis of the blown up orbifold just involves integrating out the analogs of these UNs when N is not zero and finding the low energy action for the remaining zero modes. So it'll be going through the same procedure, but properly integrating out the massive modes. And those are what project to a non-trivial metric for the modes that remain. Okay, so, so our final example is this Kummer K3 orbifold. So I'm gonna repeat the previous construction with two simple modifications. I'm gonna replace the torus with the Z2 quotient, right? That's literally just doing this. And now, instead of just studying the U infinity to the fourth theory, infinity to the fourth, because the lattice is sort of infinite in four dimensions, I study the U two times infinity to the fourth, right? What's like the K equals two version of the sim K of T4. So I have two, two D brains in each little fundamental domain on the torus, and I do the Z2 quotient, so I identify them. So by analogy with our construction of Z2 mod Z2, the Z2 acts in this way. It inverts where you are in the lattice, and it acts by switching the two brains in each domain. And again, we use sigma Z instead of sigma X because that's a more convenient basis. So now, now you just, I literally analyze this theory in presence of what parameters? Well, there's 58 parameters. There's 10 metric parameters in your choice of covering torus. Now there's also um, FI terms in these theories in general. It turns out that after you include all the orbifold identifications, you get precisely 16 times three FI parameters. They're parametrized by choices of points in lambda mod two lambda, where lambda is the lattice, okay? And so that gives you 58 parameters, which not coincidentally is the number of parameters in the classical differential geometry of uh, a Ritchie flat K3 metric. Okay. So if you now turn on FI terms and integrate out the mass of UNs and VNs and write the kinetic term for the remaining low energy scalars, that's a hyper K1 manifold. It's compact at dimension four and it's a blown up T4 mod Z2. Uh, so it's the K3. Okay, so I've given you no formulas here. Um, I have six minutes left, so I guess I could have crammed in some pages of complicated formulas, um, but it's not my style at my age. I barely understand the complicated formulas, um, but they exist in the paper. So we, we expanded this to lowest non-trivial order in blow up modes. And one thing we checked is the resulting metric is, is non-trivially rigid flat at that order. Okay, so that's there. Um, we also checked something um, more interesting, which is if you Poisson resum the resulting formula in a suitable way to match the Coulomb branch variables, you can read off the BPS spectrum of that D3 theory in the case that it was near any of the sort of Z2 fixed points of T4 mod Z2, and precisely read off a BPS spectrum of the SU2 gauge theory with four flavors that you expect to arise at those singularities. But now with actually extra massive strings that wind sort of all the way around the K3 and come back and hit the same thing. So you get uh, infinitely many copies shifted in mass of the SU2 gauge theory with four flavors out of this Poisson connection. And so that's the dumbest example of recovering the BPS spectrum of the 4D theory um, or, or the resulting 3D theory um, by doing this kind of blow up mode expansion. And in a paper that I was not part of, but that uses the same ideas around different orbifold points, so that instead of putting a three brain near a T4 mod Z2 fixed point, you put it near a T4 mod Zn fixed point with various values of n, 
Um, Tripathy and Zmet sort of generalized this style of construction to all of those. And the theories that arise at the corners of those orbifolds are, for instance, Menahan Nemeshansky theories. So you can actually predict new BPS counts there as well as reproducing old ones, um, if that excites you. So there's a lot of further work to be done here, um, both to formulate expansions around other low so and moduli space. And maybe more interestingly, if, if your real motivation is mathematics, you need to actually prove that the physics that I just sort of mumbled about for 56 minutes um, results in convergent expansions for the resulting data. Okay, so uh, there are reasons to think it should, which we put in our first paper on this on the, from the Coulomb branch side. We think the expansions should be convergent and we give a physics proof. But giving a really you know, mathematically rigorous proof that the perturbation theory in blow up modes converges and can be suitably resummed to disk instanton answers, is a, that's a real program in math. Um, that's above my pay grade, but Max and Arnold, I guess, want to have healthy salaries, and so it's not above their pay grade. And so Tripathi and Zemet, and also mathematicians, Fredrickson and Zeo, and maybe eventually others, are, are working on turning this into, uh, you know, into something that could appear in a math paper. Um, the resulting BPS invariants that we just started to extract, but could be extracted in more detail, have interpretations in enumerative geometry, and so give predictions for algebraic geometry. Um, that's all I wanted to say. I have three minutes left, but I'm going to end early. So if you did pay attention, thanks for your attention. Uh, if you didn't pay attention, uh, good for you. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thank you, Charmit, for the nice uh, talk. Uh, if there are any questions, please just unmute yourself and go ahead. About Enrique surfaces. Um, okay, I haven't really thought about the question. I guess one standard construction of Enrique surfaces is by Z2 involution. Um, so I think you could get metrics on Enrique surfaces that, that descend directly from a known involution without any trouble, right? It's, a, it's an involution with no fixed points. So I think if you had an explicit enough formula for the K3 metric, yes, you would, you would in principle get nice formulas for Enrique surfaces too. Uh, is, does that answer your question, Jonathan? Yeah. Thanks. Really good question. K3 vibrations over P1, or to make a Calabia threefold, can you say anything about that case? Yeah, I mean, in the limit of large base, I think it's sort of obvious that you'll get nice, nice formulas. You know, I think the really interesting question is whether if you know something about the limit of large base, um, and have some other indirect data about details of the theory, could you fix the real metric? I have no reason to think so. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of knowing what you should and should not be able to do on general grounds. On general grounds, I would have thought a hyper -KMR metric is something you should be able to fix, or a Coulomb branch metric in a theory with 16 supercharges is something you should, sorry, with eight supercharges is something you should be able to fix. Um, I think of a cloud be a threefold as the target of an N equals one supersymmetric sigma model in four dimensions, um, because that's what a brain probe would give you. I don't think you should be able to find the metric. And so my guess is there will be no formula for such metrics unless the holonomy is really reduced and you can use special tricks. But, you know, hopefully I'm wrong. So in the end, you didn't really, um use anything about GMN and the Coulomb branch side. Uh, you were using the fact that the K3 surface was the Higgs branch of this D2 brain probe theory. Um, and, and in some sense, this is a calculation you could have done a decade ago or more. I could have done this calculation in 1998. Um, yeah, uh, uh, as I said, ago. at the start of the, uh, at the, start of the, the talk, if you're interested in the metric, you could skip the 40 minutes in between. I can give you a, an infinite dimensional hyper K or quotient and, and you can do it. And I think that's correct. Um, the main thing that, that I get out of GMN is another class of questions that I think this, this gives you connection to. And so that, you know, that, that hyper K or quotient construction is fine and answers the question, I think, as long as the, the suitable convergence properties can be proved rigorously, which as I said, people are working on. Um, 
but it's also, you know, the fun in the subject, I don't care what the metric is to tell you the truth, but, but I care about connections between objects. And so if you can use that to determine disk sums and then show that those disk sums fed into strong Driao's Aslow show that this is an example of SYC determining the Claudio metric, I think that's sort of a deeper conceptual story that's of interest to me than saying, here's a hyperkamer quotient, do it to your heart's content and, and find the metric to nine decimal places. So, so that's why I talked about it the way I did. Is, is, that, does that, is that relevant to the, the point you were raising, Jacques? Oh no, 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 it's 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 great. I was I, I was actually interested uh, both in the motivation for doing it now as opposed to twenty years ago, um, and and I think that addresses that question. Yeah. So yeah, thanks. to tell you the truth, we were too stupid to realize you could just do it, and I didn't know that anyone else had either. So we were led to the realization you could just do it by this much fancier set of questions, and then we were like, well, can't we just do it? Right. Thanks. By the way, I'll say for the CY3 question, I completely agree with Shamit that I don't expect to be able to write down a metric in the case where CY3 is general holonomy. But I think we do expect on similar grounds to be able to uh, compute the discounts. So the guys that actually contribute in the GMN formula and for K3s, they will no longer contribute to the metric. They'll compute something else. But they're interesting numbers. Yeah, and let me let me add let me say something about what Arnab just said too. Morally, something you should expect to compute with that sort of amount of symmetry kinematically is a superpotential. Um, one thing disk instantons contribute to in suitable circumstances is a superpotential. So either in that context or others, um, I expect really smart people who work hard enough to get exact formulas for superpotential sooner or later, um, and maybe that's what will come out. Yeah, I might imagine there's some like intermediate case where uh, it's not like got full SU3 holonomy, but it's not also got uh, SU2 holonomy. So something kind of in between. I think this is a trick people play sometimes with it where it's not exactly like G2 or something like that. That Do you think that that case might be tractable? If you do something you know, like SU2, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say like SU2 times Z2, there's some simple cases like that. I think yes. that's a case where special tricks would lead to yes, but it's very clear it's a special trick. So I don't find it that interesting. Sure. I mean, you've thought about this more than me. What do you think? No, that's exactly right. I mean, you can do K3 times an elliptic curve mods, something on which you would compactify to get CHL strings. But yes, the fact that you can get a metric on those guys is about as interesting as the fact that you can get a metric on Enrique surfaces. They just directly descend from the metric on a K3. Sure. It's also just by the way, um, so one, one reason to care about both the Coulomb and Higgs branch formalisms here is that if you want to actually compute stuff, the, the expressions that you get converge at very different rates. So even if you can get the Higgs branch metric to work out and it's all fantastic and classically exact, you might still like to read off the BPS numbers to get this other exponentially suppressed instanton expansion, which might converge much more quickly. All right, should we call it a day? Sure, I can stop the recording. And